Well, hey, good morning, Grace Bible Church. Good to be with you. If you're new, glad you're here. Uh, online, Norfolk, Strawbridge, glad you guys are here. If we haven't met, my name is Matt. I'm our Strawbridge campus pastor. And before we jump in, I just wanted to share something special uh, with you. It's something that's close to my heart, and I know it's something that y'all would be excited about as well. And that's on September 17th, we will be celebrating that one year from that date, we, as Grace Bible Church, launched our third campus, right? <laughs> Come on. Strawbridge will be celebrating its one-year birthday then. We're super excited about that. And let me tell you a little bit about what God has been doing in the last year. We uh, set out to launch the Strawbridge campus a while ago, and it's been about a year. And, and when we launched, we had some goals. We're like, man, it would be great if we could launch brand, uh, two new brand, brand new community groups in the Southern Virginia Beach area. We were able to launch six. We were like, man, if five middle school students showed up to AMP, that would be great. Sometimes they're close to 20. Uh, we had our first serve the city back in January and over 70 people came, and we've had others serve the cities since then. Our attendance has been holding strong at around 260, 270 with adults and kids and teenagers. We've seen new relationships form. We've seen new leaders step up. It's been really cool to see all the work that God has been doing in Southern Virginia Beach. But I wanna tell you about Mackenzie's story. Mackenzie is a new friend of mine, and uh, she's new to our Strawbridge campus. Shout out, Mackenzie. She hates that I'm probably doing this right now, but uh, Mackenzie was invited by Sean and Victoria Kelly, uh, who are Strawbridge regulars. They serve on, all, on a bunch of our teams at Strawbridge, and, and they brought Mackenzie and her husband, uh, and Mackenzie got plugged into their community group through Rooted, which is an awesome small group experience that we'll be launching in the fall. And through Rooted and coming to our Strawbridge campus over the last few months, she decided to go public with her faith and was baptized at Beach Baptisms just a few Sundays ago. Isn't that great? <laughs> So God's grace is changing lives. We're seeing people in a, entering into a growing relationship with Jesus in Southern Virginia Beach. But uh, for just a moment, I'd like to, you guys can just tune in this, but I would like to speak directly to our Strawbridge volunteers uh, for just a moment. Thank you. Like, thank you for doing what you do. Without the work that you've done over this last year, uh, none of what we've been able to accomplish, none of the lives changed would have happened. So I'm so grateful for you and how God has used you and I'm so grateful and excited for what God is gonna do in and through each and every single one of you in the next year to come. Can we give it up for our Strawbridge volunteers just for a moment? Love you guys. All right, so we are in a, kind of a brand new series. We started this last week called Stand Firm. And this series is all about how we are in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual fight. Whether you believe in God or not, there is this spiritual fight going on in the supernatural realm that exists, right? It's this fight and it's real and we wanna teach you how to stand firm in that fight. Now let me ask you a question. It's kind of a personal question. Has anybody ever been in a fight before? Like a physical fight, like fists were flying, roundhouse kicks were going, do people roundhouse kick each other? in real fights that's not just in the movies. I'm showing my cards here because I've only ever been in one physical fight my entire life, and it was in kindergarten, so you know the stakes were high, okay? <laughs> so I, uh, I was, I don't know if you can tell by looking at me, but I was quite the ladies' man in kindergarten, <laughs> believe it or not. And I was on the playground one day during recess, and all these girls were chasing me, okay? They were chasing me all around the playground, and then they cornered me, and they cir and circled me, and they started pulling me every, this is a real story, okay? This actually happened. And they were pulling me every which way and trying to like pull me away from the other one, and I was panicking, and I didn't know what to do. And my friend sees me from across the playground, and he's like, Matt has too many girls after him. I gotta go save him. This is not a problem I had later in life. Um, but... <laughs> He runs over and, he, and he, he gets this circle of girls that are just trying to tear me apart and he, and he reaches his hand in to grab me, to pull me out to safety. Now from my perspective, I'm panicking, right? And I don't know what's going on and I feel this really strong hand grab me and I panic even more and I turn around and just <laughs> punch him in the face as hard as I possibly can. Now, I want to acknowledge the obvious, that my friend's sacrifice saved me from being known as a girl puncher my entire school career. My life might have looked very differently had he not been there and I punched him in the face. But why did I punch him in the face? Okay, because all these people were trying to basically tear me apart, pull me every which way. I didn't know who was a friend and who was an enemy. I didn't know who was there to help or who was there to hurt. 
And isn't that true in life? that you don't really know a lot of the time who wants something for you and who just wants something uh, from you. It's so easy to misidentify our enemy sometimes. And last week, Eric talked about how we are in this spiritual battle. And in this spiritual battle we're in, there is an enemy. And I wanna be really clear today about who that enemy is and how you can fight against that enemy. because. I don't want you punching the wrong people in the face. I don't want you punching the wrong people in the face. I don't know if you know this, but Christians are kind of known for being combative towards people. We're we're known for being uh, defensive and being offensive sometimes. Christians in the world are commonly known for who they're against and, and not really who they are for. That's why uh, if you go to any of our campuses today, you'll see or hear the phrase uh, for the 757. Because we as a church, uh, we believe that the church for too long has been known for what it's against. And we wanna be known for what we're for. We wanna be known for for who we're for because Christians for, for too long have been known for being against people and identifying, I think misidentifying people as the enemy. And I just wanna be really clear as we get started today that people are not our enemy. People are not our enemy. And we do have a real enemy. If you've done Rooted, our small group experience, which I just mentioned earlier, uh, or if you're gonna do it this fall coming up, you're gonna go through this week called There Is an Enemy, and it's this week all about supernatural uh, warfare and how there is a real enemy working in the supernatural realm against all people who believe in God and people who don't believe in God, people who don't believe you're not exempt from this fight. And if we spend all of our time fighting the wrong enemy, we give our real enemy an opportunity to infiltrate our lives and to take control, to manipulate. And so as we talk about supernatural uh, fight, as we talk about the, the supernatural battle and standing firm in that, we need to be really clear about who our enemy is and how we can stand firm in that battle. We've been in the book of Ephesians uh, and will be in the book of Ephesians this entire series. Uh, If you have a Bible, the words will be on the screen in verses, but we'll be in Ephesians 6, uh, 10 uh, through 14 today. Uh, But Paul in Ephesians 6 gives this kind of how-to manual for spiritual warfare. And, And he has this famous passage, this famous section of chapter six that's uh, often referred to as the armor of God, where he refers to uh, Roman armor and weaponry, and he compares them to spiritual attributes that we can use to fight our spiritual enemy in this spiritual battle. Uh, So we're going to look at those in just a moment, but before we do, before we get to the armor of God, we need to give uh, some some context and look at the preceding verses. Eric talked about uh, these verses last week, and I'd encourage you to go back and watch that message if you haven't checked in on it, but we're gonna go back to it. We handed out memory verse cards last week, and I heard that a lot of people didn't get some, and so if you didn't get a memory verse card uh, from last week, you can grab one at guest services at any of the campuses today. But we're gonna go ahead and jump into Ephesians 6, uh, verse 10, to give us uh, a little bit of a setup here. He says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Let's just pause for a moment and acknowledge that, especially if you're new to reading your Bible, this sounds weird, right? Like, it just sounds a little weird. And we're talking about dark forces, we're talking about the devil and his schemes, the heavenly realms, This feels a little bit uh, advanced. Maybe it feels a little bit 201, 301 as you're reading this or as you're hearing this. Uh, It feels different. It feels like something out of a fantasy novel, right? Now, let me just free you. If it feels weird to you, it's because it is. (laughs) It is weird. But Paul wants you to know that no matter how weird it might sound or out of the natural world it might sound, that spiritual warfare and spiritual forces in our world are real. And they're not peripheral to our day-to-day life. In fact, they're a whole lot more front and center than you would realize. It's a big deal. And he says in this spiritual battle, uh, he wants to be really clear about who the enemy is not and who the enemy is. 
He says, your enemy is not flesh and blood. Stop attacking people. Stop thinking that people, whether they follow God or not, whether they have a different morality than you or not, they're not your enemy. You have a real enemy. And he says that your enemy is the devil, the spiritual force, the spiritual entity, this person who is the embodiment of evil and behind all of the evil in our world. That's our enemy. And you need to stand firm against him. How do we do that? He carries on in verse 13. He says this, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. You may be able to stand your ground. What Paul wants us to do is to stand firm. Eric talked last week about uh, what that means and that's putting our belief and our trust in God that no matter what life throws at you, no matter how hard it gets or no matter how good it gets and how easy it is to forget that God's the one who gave you the good thing, stand firm. Your trust, your faith, the source of life that you have, it's, it's God. Keep your eyes fixed and focused on him. And what the devil wants is not that. What the devil wants is to knock you off your feet. He does not want you to stand firm. He wants you to put your faith and your trust in anything but God. He does not want you to stand firm. Later in the Bible, another book of the Bible in 1 John, it unpacks this more clearly, but I'll summarize this for you. The devil's schemes, it, Paul uses this word devil's scheme, is to get you to deny Jesus as God. This is how the devil works in your life to get you to not stand firm, to knock you off your feet. The devil would love nothing more than for you to believe that Jesus was just a good moral teacher, that he had some good things to say, but he wasn't fully God. Even better than that, it, the devil would love for you to believe that Jesus was just a lunatic, that he was just crazy, anything but God. And if you believe in Jesus as God, you say, man, I've given my life to Jesus. I believe that he's God. I believe that he exists. I'm good. Like this, the devil's scheme isn't gonna work on me because I already believe. And in a sense, you would be correct. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. But that does not mean that the devil will not work in your life to get you to believe this in more subtle ways. Let me explain what I mean by that. Believing in Jesus as God has implications. It has implications. It's not just an internal belief. It's an internal belief that comes with external realities that are tied together. It means that if I believe Jesus is God, then I believe that he also has the authority of God. And if I believe that he has the authority of God, then that means I believe he has God-like authority that Jesus' his authority is not partial, it's complete, it's not passive, it's active, it's not limited, it is unlimited and covers every area of my life. And I need to submit to that authority in every area of my life. But what the enemy will do is try to get you to believe that there are areas of your life where you get to deny Jesus as God and that you get to be God over that area of your life. Uh, the way Paul Tripp, a, a theologian and pastor, puts this is he calls it practical atheism. That there are people like you and even me who believe at a higher level, you know, yeah, God exists. I believe Jesus is, is fully God and, and that he died for my sins and that he rose again. And I, and I believe that at this large level, but there's this area of my life where I'm gonna deny his existence. I'm gonna deny his authority. For me, the area, uh, I'll just speak for myself, the area of my life where this is most prevalent is in money. I heard some, mm, there, yeah. Yeah, maybe you, maybe you too. Uh, man, the, the devil would love nothing more than for, for Matt Love to believe that he gets to be God over, over his own money. And let me be honest with you, because we can over-spiritualize things and, and go to different extremes. It is the devil's work in my life, but I also like the sound of that too that I get to control, that I get to deny what God says about how I should spend and give and sacrifice the money that he gives me. Man, I would love nothing more than to deny Jesus' existence as God when it comes to my money and other areas too. We all have areas of our life where the devil wants us to believe, man, Jesus, he's not God over this part. He's not God over this part of you. you he doesn't know what's good for you, but you do. You know what's good for you. 
So what do we do? How do we, how do we stand firm against this scheme? Paul tells us that we stand firm by putting on the armor of God. And that's what we'll spend the rest of today and um, these next few weeks unpacking these different pieces of armor today. We're gonna start with two different pieces of armor today. We're gonna start with this, Ephesians 6, 14. Paul says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. He talks about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. The, the belt uh, was this piece of Roman armor it wasn't really armor, it didn't really protect you from much, but it was absolutely foundational and essential for your armor because without the belt, you wouldn't have freedom of movement in battle and without the belt, you wouldn't be able to secure the breastplate in place. The belt was foundational for holding some of the most important pieces of armor in place and without it, the armor would just fall off and you would be vulnerable. And then he says, put on the breastplate. The breastplate was this piece of armor that covered the chest. It covered all of the frontward facing internal organs. And, and without it, you left those parts vulnerable. With the exception of the helmet, it protected the most vulnerable parts of the body. And Paul says that he, it compares these two pieces of armor to truth and to righteousness. That believing in truth, believing truth exists is foundational to your defense against the attacks of the enemy. Believing in truth. And then living righteously, living righteously, living a righteous life, a moral life that protects the most vulnerable parts of us from the attacks of the enemy. Let's unpack what each of these things means a little bit further. We'll start with uh, truth. Jesus says uh, that the devil is the father of lies. He says this earlier in the Gospels. The Gospels are these kind of biographical accounts of Jesus' life. And Jesus says in the Gospels that the devil, he's the father of lies. That no truth exists in him. And the moment he opens his mouth, deceit is what's gonna come out. Deceit is what's gonna come out. It, he cannot tell the truth. He's the father of of lies. It's his primary strategy to get you and me to deny Jesus as God in any area of our lives. And then by contrast, God is the father of truth. He, he only tells the truth. Every time he opens his mouth, it is trustworthy, it is right, it is pure, it is holy, it is true. And people say God can do whatever he wants. No, he can't. He can't lie. It's not in his nature. And so we have these two spiritual forces at work in our world, and then we have us caught in the middle, truth and lies and us caught in the middle. And this has been going on for a long time, a long time. We go to the very first pages of the Bible. We go to the book of Genesis where God creates the world. And at the end of each day, God looks at his creation and says that what he made that day was good, that it was so good. And then he creates us, mankind, and he says that we are good, that we are the pinnacle of his creation. And he puts mankind in a garden. And he says, you have freedom. You can do whatever you want. You have to do whatever you want. You, you, this, this world that I've made is yours and it is yours to enjoy. You have complete and total freedom. Do whatever you want, except do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. For if you eat from it, you will surely die. And because God is a God, not a God of manipulation and, and uh, yeah, manipulation, but he's a God of freedom and choice, he gives us the choice to choose him or to choose something else. And it says that Eve, uh, the first woman that God makes, goes and she looks at the tree and there waiting for her is the enemy. And the enemy says, did God really say? Maybe something you've heard before in the depths of your soul, in the back of your mind, did God really say that you would die if you ate from this tree? Did God really say he knew what was good for you? Did God really say he wanted you to have freedom? And after listening to lie after lie after lie, it says that Eve looks at the tree and it, and it says this, that it looked good for eating. That same word for good is a callback to what God said was good. It's the same word in Hebrew that she uses, that God uses to define his creation as good. 
And she eats from the tree and it brings sin and destruction and death into the world. And here from the pages of scripture, the first pages, we get the first truth that what God makes and designs is good. And then we get the first lie that what we can define, that we can look at the world and we can define what's good ourselves. God creates everything good. And then he says, hey, I'm gonna give you freedom. And you can choose evil or you can choose good. And we choose we rebrand evil as good. And sin and, dis- and destruction and death comes into the world. And throughout the pages of scripture, we see this happen time and time again. God says, I'm gonna make what's good and I'm gonna set up life for you to be good. And then we continually choose our own good. There's this point in the story of God's people where they become so big, they become a nation. And, and God's their king, but then they look around at all the other nations and they say, the grass is greener. We want a king like the other nations. And God says, no, that's not good for you to have another king. It's not gonna work. There's gonna be pride. There's gonna be destruction. There's gonna be death. It's not gonna be good. And they say, nope, that's what we want. And so because God is a God of freedom and choice, he says, go for it. And they have a king and No surprise, it continues to bring more sin and and death and destruction into our world. And this continually happens time and time again throughout the pages of the Bible, throughout the pages of history. And then we get to today, and good news, we've got to figure it out. (laughs) No, we don't. We do not. This is the world we still live in today. We live in a world where we believe it's so easy to believe that truth, what we believe is good, is something we get to define ourselves. And don't think for a moment that this is just for people who don't call themselves Christians. This is me, this is you, this is all of us. We all got areas of our life where we think we get to define what's true and good for ourselves and ignore what God actually says about the thing. We're all just as guilty. There was a study done uh, a few years ago, two or three years ago, that said that 58% of Americans believe that right and wrong is defined by the individual. 46% of people who attend churches, much like ours, do not believe in a universal moral standard. 46% of people who sit in seats like you're sitting in right now, do not believe that a universal moral standard exists. And I think these statistics can be jarring, uh, they can be discouraging, but also I kind of get it. I get it, we're so tempted to, believe, to define truth for ourselves because we live in a world where everybody's pulling at us saying, this is my truth, so come over here and believe what I say about the thing. And then we've got other people on the opposite end saying, no, this is my truth, their truth is wrong, come over and believe what I say about the thing. And then church people step in and they're like, no, we've got God on our side, we know what the, the, the thing is and the truth about it. And then you see that they're just as messed up as the rest of you, and that the, you know, institutions fail and, and leaders fall and there's lack of integrity. And you start to wonder, can I really trust anybody's truth? And then you kind of come out swinging, much like me on that kindergarten playground all of those years ago, everybody pulls you which way and you start punching people in the face and you say you know what I'm just going to define my own truth because I can't trust any of you I can't trust any of you and I get that I understand that I feel that in me but let me tell you then you just become part of the problem because then you do the same thing you do the same thing that the people who are attacking you and attacking you do I want to be really clear lies exist in our world Truth exists in our world. And behind both of those things is a person. And behind that person is an agenda. Behind every lie that exists in this world is your enemy. Behind every lie in this world is the devil who would love nothing more than to pull you away from the love of God and the life that he has designed for you. And behind every truth is no matter how uncomfortable, no matter how much it might grate or collide with your personal preferences or proclivities, is your heavenly Father who loves you, 
who wants nothing more for you than to live the life of goodness and freedom that he had for you. And we live in a world, Eric talked about this beautifully last week, of already and not yet. We live in this world that's filled with tension. And as long as you believe truth, it's not gonna be easy, but there's gonna be freedom that you're gonna see come into your life because your heavenly father is the one who's behind it. And he loves you and he wants the best for you. My goal for you today, I mean, I don't want you to find the devil in every, in every corner. That's not the win. My goal for you is not to be arrogant about truth because at the end of the day, we're all figuring it out and we're not gonna know this side of eternity, sometimes what's right and what's wrong. We should have humility about it. Uh, my goal is for you to just love truth. I just want you to love truth. My goal for you today is not to hear what I think about truth and my opinions about what I think it is. I just want you to know who's behind it. Don't trust me. Don't trust anyone that stands on a stage like this. Trust the one who's behind truth. Because if you believe, if you believe and you trust that God is the author of truth and that he's the one who's behind it, it allows you to put some good things into place. Paul talks about the breastplate of righteousness. We'll, we'll, I'll unpack that and I'll be shorter with this because I think once you, um, you can wrap your mind around the fact that the objective truth exists, then like, much like the belt allowing you to put on the breastplate, it makes putting a lot of things in your life on a lot easier. Um, when Paul says the breastplate of righteousness, he's talking about right or moral living. The way that I say it simply to kind of go with Paul's uh, language is righteousness is just truth lived out. Righteousness is external, truth is internal. Uh, I, I believe that God has things to say about how Matt Love should spend his money, about how he should sacrifice, how he should give, how he should be generous to those, how he should not hold on to it. That's truth, I do it. That's righteousness. I believe that God has things to say about morality, about the value of human life, about uh, revenge, about parenting, about how I would treat people who I consider enemies. Truth claims that God makes, I do it, I follow it, I support it, that's righteousness. That's righteousness. I used to be our student director here for a, a long time and uh, we would bring on leaders to uh, lead our high school students in small groups and lead them in their growing relationship with Jesus. And one of the things that we would say to them when they came onto our team, it was always such a cool thing and it's a long process to go through because we care about middle school and high school teenagers and so we wanted to make sure that we attracted the best people and so we would bring them on. And one of the things that I would say to them and that I, I believe we still say to them is, hey, uh, you, you are a leader here. You're leading teenagers. That's a big deal. Um, and so you can't post whatever you want on social media anymore because you're setting an example. We're teaching students about righteousness and we wanna see you live that out in every sphere of your life. We did this because we wanted teenagers to learn how to live righteously and follow people who were examples of that. Hear me really clearly, not perfect people. Man, our student ministry volunteers, some of the most messed up people you ever meet in your life. <laughs> but righteousness is their compass. Righteousness is the gravitational pull that when they get out of that, they get caught back up in it. They are some of the best volunteers in our church because they live righteous lives, not perfect lives, righteous lives. That's the difference. And I could, I could, I could get excited about that and talk about that, but what I want to know, and this is what I want you to know, is that it's not just about setting an example. It's about freedom that God wants for you, that righteous living actually brings freedom for, for you. It's not about being better, it's not about being holier, it's about what God wants for you. Let's go back to Genesis for, for just a, a moment. The enemy wanted mankind to buy into this lie that God would withhold something good from you. So he convinced us to believe that we could define what was good and what wasn't, and it brought sin and death and destruction. But what God had made was good. It was the very definition of freedom. So righteous living is not about being holier than the rest of the world. It's about the freedom that God wants to give you. Now you can find that righteous, that manual for righteous living in your Bibles and you can look and you can see the things that God says about life. Timeless truths that were written thousands of years ago but apply to you just as much today. But the cool thing about a growing relationship with Jesus is God's also gonna speak to you. He's gonna speak to your thoughts. He's gonna speak through people and doing the things that he tells you to do in those moments, that's also righteousness as well. 
Uh, a, a few, um, almost a year ago now, December 22, my wife Jenny was pregnant with our, our second Marilyn, who's five months old right now. And uh, she came to me in December and she said, Matt, I think I wanna quit my job. She was an uh, art teacher um, at a middle school. Shout out, Lansdown Lancers. Um, that's where she was. And, and she, uh, she said, I, I wanna quit my job. I think God's telling me to quit. I think God's telling me to quit my job and stay home now that we're having two kids. And what I heard was, God wants you to give up half our money? <laughs> I don't think he's saying that. <laughs> that was the enemy, right? Coming back and coming back. And, and eventually the, the Lord softened my heart. I'm so grateful for my wife and how like God speaks to her in such clear ways and how he uses her to lead our family in that. And I'm so grateful uh, for that gifting that she has. But she... Um, we, God led us there, and I also wanna be clear, like with a story like this, I feel like it's important to say, like God sometimes leads people to different conclusions, right? And God led us to have a parent who stays at home, uh, happened to be uh, Jenny, the wife in this situation, and I'm so grateful for the moms who have been led to stay at home and have made that choice, and I'm so grateful for the women who God has genuinely led to work and to lead and to be in the workforce and to be CEOs and to be leaders and who are still great moms in the midst of that, and I'm so grateful grateful for all of you who do that. This is just what God led us to. And let me tell you, we're a couple months into this, and I want to let you know what God has done, and he's shown us two things uh, about obedience and righteousness. The first thing is you're going to have to give up something. Man, you're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to sacrifice a lot when God calls you to be righteous, when God calls us to be obedient. Just the world we live in, it's what you're going to have to do. And man, there have been times in these last few months where there's been like bills that come into the mail. We're like, we don't know what to, what to do with this. And the enemy whispers, did God really say this is what he wanted for you? Because you could just do the opposite of what he said and this would be taken care of. And we're like, we don't know what to do with this. Uh, do we just put this bill in the freezer or throw it out? I don't know. And but we said, no, God called us to this. We have to give it up and we have to trust him. And we've noticed that we've had to give up stuff. That's the first thing. The second thing is you will experience more freedom than you've ever experienced in your life because obedience always brings freedom. For us, man, we're starting to dream about things we've never been able to dream about, being the husband that I wanna be, being the father that I wanna be, being able to build a family that we couldn't talk about or think about before because we were to ships passing in the night. And God has brought this level of freedom that that we wouldn't trade for anything, any amount of money, because obedience brings freedom. <laughs> obedience brings freedom, and it's gonna be hard, and it's gonna be difficult, and I don't wanna be unempathetic, because you're gonna have to give up a lot. But what God makes is good, and it brings freedom to our lives. Your enemy is real, and he has a goal. He doesn't want you to believe that righteousness leads to freedom. He doesn't want you to believe that truth will lead to righteousness. And he most certainly does not want you to believe that behind all truth is your heavenly father who loves you and wants everything for you. Here's a question I'll close this with. What truth are you denying that's leading you away from righteous living? And I say this just as one of you man, God, I gotta, give you, I gotta give you my money. I gotta be generous. I gotta give you my pride. I've gotta give you my anger. Because you say things about all of that. What am I giving you, God? What truth are you denying that's leading you away from righteous living and eventually the free life that God wants for you? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are good and that you know what's good and that you know what's free. Thank you that you love us that you are for us, you are not against us. God, in this battle that we're in, give us the strength and the clarity and the courage to put on the armor of God, to put on the belt of truth, and to put on that breastplate of righteousness so that the arrows of the enemy that come at us will bounce off, that the force of the enemy that would come at us would not push us off of our feet, but we would be people who stand firm and are not arrogant in that standing firm, but humble because you're the one who is the source of our strength. God, thank you for what you give us, the clarity, the truth, the guidance, the grace, the mercy, and the love. You are so good. And it's in your son's holy name that we say, amen.